First thing I want to do is just to really quickly look at what we missed last time. So as you can see, there's a bunch of strike throughs now through the, um, the last lecture notes. Um, so we didn't get through a bunch of stuff. So just to get th um, to cover all the stuff that I'd really like to cover, I think what we'll do today is we'll kind of go like much faster through all the material. Um, so like we'll be kind of going at a very high level. And also just to give ourselves some more time, we're going to skip the break today. We're just going to fly right on through. Um, and don't take bathroom breaks either. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We'll take a break. And, uh, um, <laughs> um, but basically, what I'm what I'm trying to hint at is that we've had like there's a lot of material, and we're kind of like have to make sacrifices as we go. I'll also address this whole theory and code thing. So um, we haven't ha we haven't done as much like coding as I was expecting at the outset of the class. That's because, like, as we run out of time, I really kind of want to uh, prioritize a deeper understanding and like of the theory of the applications, um, because the implementations change all the time, and in machine learning in particular, it's really, really fast moving. So, like, we're going to talk about DeepTream today, which um, which is done in a framework that most of the new stuff that's coming out in machine learning is not even using anymore. Um, and, and actually, hopefully, we'll have a little bit of time to talk about some of these tools and more generally when we get to the deep learning sort of resources that are available. Um, but really, like, my goal, like, the very, f the, if nothing else comes out of this class, I want people to feel like they can explain these things at a dinner table conversation. Like, okay, I understand, I can tell you how Deep Dream works. Um, and that's, that's what we're going to aim for today. With the implementations, you'll see that when, and again, we'll, we'll see this more closely when we talk about the deep learning tools out there, they're all very high level. So like you instantiate the architecture of a neural network in some of these libraries in a few lines of code where all of the internal data structures are totally encapsulated. So they're very, they're very, very high level. Uh, and like, like, for example, we'll talk about like Keras and Lasagna and these, these kinds of tools later, you'll, you'll see that come to play. And so a lot of the, a lot of the, like, um, the implementations should make a lot of sense uh, if you understand the sort of, the, the, at a conceptual level, what they're doing. Um, that's the harder thing to understand conceptually what's going on. And, um, and I, and I want to more or less prioritize that. Um, so that's why, and so I think today we'll kind of, um, we'll stick also to a theory, a theory level. Um, but we're, ta we're actually talking about applications, but we'll stick to the theory of how they work. Um, the office hours, I think I've met with like a third of you so far. Um, uh, we, you know, the, originally I think we <laughs> talked about having everyone present once before the last week, I guess that was sort of a little bit hubris on my part to expect that that was possible. Um, so that's that's probably not going to happen, but it's still an open invitation for people to present before week seven. Um, so let me know. Just email me if you have some stuff prepared that you want to show, um, which you think is relevant, and we can we can have a discussion like like with, like the way we had with Nick um, last week. Uh, this week, oh, and uh, also um, yeah, so I'll have office hours next week. Uh, I think we. I said on Tuesday. Raise your hands if to, uh, like Tuesday, twelve to three, you're free, available. Just not too many. And what? And how about Wednesday, same time, like this week we had. It's. It, am I right that more of you are available on Wednesday than Tuesday? Is that normal? Maybe. Okay, I'll send the poll this week, maybe, and maybe we'll just do it on Wednesday. Um, regardless, uh, if you. Uh, I, I'm spending most days uh, when I'm not here at DBRS Labs, which is just down the street, basically. So I have, I'm just working from there. So that's also just an open invitation for people to come. It's also a good time to come because uh, you'll, away from this floor, you might have, like, might have more of my attention uh, because things are kind of frantic here. Um, I was here yesterday until 5.30, I think. I said I'd be here until 3 and I ended up at 5.30. Oh. Um, that's okay. That's, that's all good. This, this is an exciting uh, thing to be doing right now, so we're all good. Um, it's going to get hairy from here. I don't remember why I wrote this. Uh, oh, I guess because basically we're, we're really sort of approaching my limitations here now at this point, now that we're getting into, like, covenants. Um, and so... That's kind of, maybe that's a bad thing that might like disinspire your confidence in me, but, um, but the good thing about it is that um, 
really like once once you um, yeah you're you're almost at the level that like I know this stuff so um, that should maybe be actually a good thing. Uh, <laughs> um, let's see course projects. So again, like my goal is for everyone to pre and this is more or less a requirement. Um, so is for everyone to present something either in the last week of uh, when we have class presentations or in the week before. So this is um, kind of like uh, why you should be come to meet with me. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people have really great project ideas uh, and the earlier you can start in them, the more time you'll be able to um, kind of have to figure it out. And you know, in the last week, obviously like if you wait until the last week, and everyone waits until the last week, and, and we're, I'm trying to meet with everyone, that's going to make things like difficult for everyone. So try to start early in these projects, throw, throw out some ideas. Um, we've, we've mostly looked at Wekinator so far, and so that's kind of been, the I think, the basis for most um, class projects, which is really great. Like Wekinator is super, you can, you know, there's a good starting point, basically. Um, some of the stuff we'll look at today is going to introduce a few new tools, which might be interesting to you guys as well. Um, a lot of people um, before, prior to this class have used some of the, like a TSNI tool that I've been making. We'll talk about TSNI later, um, which may also be of use to you guys. Um, so we're going to talk about how to, how to use those tools. Um, and, and yeah. Uh, so today is actually, like the lecture part of today is really exciting because um, the, like the, today is basically about applications of convolutional neural networks and these are mainly the things that got all the publicity last year uh, about what, what's so interesting about machine learning so we're going to talk about style transfer and deep dream and different ways of visualizing uh, convolutional neural networks and um, various other, mostly those are the, the ones that we'll cover today um, and so we're going to see a lot of like really cool pictures and really interesting um, really interesting approaches to breaking these these um, these things apart, and so it's it's interesting on one level because it produces um, really cool, crazy visuals, and we should will all be really we'll, should be really fun to look at those. Um, but also, it's interesting on a more conceptual level when you understand how we go from these um, the internal architecture of a covenant to these visualizations, and if you start to think about it a little more abstractly. It'll, the other applications that you see coming through the pipeline will start to make sense. And really, if we, if we understand what, and the main thing is to understand the activations, and we'll, we'll, when we review Covnets, we'll go over those again. Um, when you understand what those are, all the rest of these applications are actually very straightforward. So really, the, the main thing is to understand what, you know, what a Covnet is and what it's doing. Um, and okay, so we'll we'll review covenants and go over these um, go over the applications. I also wanted to really quickly highlight one uh, another just in trying uh, in keeping up with some of the critical reading stuff that we um, that I placed in the notes uh, a few weeks a few weeks ago. I want to highlight one project which is actually very uh, relevant. Something we'll we'll talk about when we get into covenants, um, which is so th this is actually from from last week. There's just a few. I think I'm missing links here actually. I'll have to review that, sorry. Um, there's a few really nice um, articles about uh, questions of bias, ownership, and privacy. So Covnets and different sort of machine learning architectures are using, t they collect and, and compute over tons and tons of data. And so uh, a few things we have to start, we have to be thinking about is who owns the data, uh, how the, uh, what is the sort of like, what are the, opt-in, opt-out structures of, of different services that use these things, uh, and what are their applications to various things outside of art. Um, and so one of them is actually, I want to show a project by an artist named Heather Dewey Hadborn, and I think maybe, I'm sure some of you know her, she actually used to teach her. Um, in fact, she taught, uh, I think, probably the first machine learning course at ITP, I think probably like, um, I think around five, six years ago. And um, around that time, she was working on this project called Strain um, Stranger Visions. How many of you guys have seen this project? Okay, one, a few people. Um, so what what she did was, uh, and and again, this is like this is still a few years before machine learning was very much in the sort of mainstream conversation. Um, she was collecting um, discarded bits of of DNA that people leave behind, so like little hairs that might fall in bathrooms, um, sweat, 
uh, anything that like you leave behind has your has a trace of your DNA. And there's really interesting applications of, of machine learning in um, in like genetic forensics. Um, so what she did was she was using nascent technologies to take this DNA and try to infer what the person actually looked like and fabricating faces from it. This is this is like this may seem very science fiction-y, but this is really actually like very much on the table. Uh, and a lot of different now private companies are looking into the same kind of technology. And actually there was a campaign, I think about a year ago, where uh, there was like, um, well, I don't even remember what city, but they were trying to shame uh, litterers by doing basically the same thing. So they would find their DNA and they would try to like show what they look like. Uh, and... To, to, to shame them. And it, was, it was like sort of an art campaign, but, but it was also like pretty uh, unsavory. I don't know, because, you know, we have to be, we have to really be thinking about like how accurate are these things, right? And it turns out that they're not accurate at all. And that was one of the things um, about this project trying to highlight. Um, there's also uh, a really, uh, like um, different countries have proposed uh, using biometric data to identify and, and keep track of, of their citizenry. And a lot of them, a lot of the times they'll use these very utopian sort of um, use cases to, to sell it to the public. So like, for example, you can do, if you have this sort of uh, enrollment, you can do a much more effective uh, campaign to distribute vaccines because you know people's blood types and you know where they're located and so on. Uh, but then what happens is that a lot of these, um, uh, a, a lot of, there's also lots of nefarious applications of this. So you can think about surveillance and, um, and just, just any sort of discrimination on the, fact, on the basis of what you know about your citizens. And if you, and they, they say it's opt-in, of course, but, but really if you don't opt-in, you're, um, uh, you're not entitled to a whole bunch of benefits that it, that it entails. So... Um, there's a lot of very interesting issues, and, and I myself actually don't know too much about them. I would really uh, recommend, if you're interested in some of those things, to read some of these. Um, and there's an interesting thing about these, and actually we'll, we'll, get, we'll, we'll talk about this when we talk about applications of covenants, um, but the idea of reconstructing things, so the way that this was inferring faces from, from the uh, DNA material, this is also something that is... Um, uh, an interesting subject with covenants and talking about reconstructing the original data from the activations and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, okay, so let's review covenants. Um, we're going to uh, talk about some of the, I want to hammer home some of the things that we kind of maybe a little bit um, didn't cover very thoroughly last week and, uh, and then we'll kind of just make sure we know the main takeaway is to understand. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, different applications of them. So any questions so far? Okay. Uh, so the first thing we'll do is review covenants. Um, so recall from, and this is a new demo actually, this was broken last time. Uh, this is the these are the weights being learned in an ordinary neural network for CIFAR-10 data. And actually, I don't have the labels on here, so I should probably have that. But like, for example, this one right here, the second to last one is ships. So you see a lot of blue. This one is horses. So you see that sort of two-faced horse in the brown against the backdrop of some green, you know, probably from grass and surroundings and so on. Uh, but the main thing we're seeing is that these um, weights no longer are very discernible the way they were with, with the digits. And the reason is because there's just too much diversity within these image classes for ordinary neural networks to form very good, um, uh, to, to form really good ideas of what these features should look like. This is, of course, uh, further constrained by only having one layer. So like if we had multiple layers, or recall we use the analogy of the, the two-headed horse, you can have one neuron responsible for a left-headed horse and another one for a right-headed horse, and then this would be the, the output neuron for horse would be the combination of those. Um, so you can form 
abstractions of features within ordinary neural networks, but when it comes to images, there's just too much of um, there's too too many ways that the data can be sort of flipped and stretched and and uh, cluttered and oriented in different three dimensional three from different viewpoints um, and occluded and so on. There's too many ways that that can happen for us to really form good impressions using ordinary neural networks alone. So that's why it is necessary to uh, create some of the innovations that we saw in CubNets. And we're going to review uh, a few of those right now. Uh, so let me open up my slides because I have some visuals for this. OK, so okay, um, I'll get to this view in a second. We want to talk about, uh, so, so one thing I want to back up, and we, we didn't really um, talk about this in, in enough detail last time. So when we when we look when we looked at the video, um, but actually let's let's go first to the demo and then I'll get back to that volume view. So you guys all re recall this, right? We have a whole bunch of uh, filters that we're sliding across the input image to generate these feature maps, and each of the feature maps are have a depth of one, right? So they're just grayscale, right? What happens in the next layer when we do another round of convolution is that all of these activation maps get flattened together and st stacked into one big volume, right? So if we go back and we look at that, we're looking at one of these, right? So before we were looking at, we, we thought of all of the inputs as being like a flat plane, like, an, um, like the grayscale image of, of the MNIST digits. Um, but that's because, um, but really it's always a volume. There's a depth and there's a, a like a horizontal and a vertical dimension. When we use color images, they're volumes, right? They're, they have a depth of three. There's a red, uh, there's a red layer. I shouldn't use layer. Let's let's call it like a plane. So there's kind of three planes in this, um, in the volume of a color image. There's a green plane, a blue plane, and a red plane. And so when we, uh, going back to this demo. This right here, the original input image, this is a volume. It has three, it has a stack, a stack of three planes, a red plane and a green plane and a blue plane. And then we generate all of these feature maps, which are, um, which are one dimensional. And then in the next layer, we stack them together into what is now a 96, um, a, a volume with 96 dimensions, right? So nine, uh, oh, sorry, not 96 dimensions. 96 um, planes. Yeah. Let's just to keep the terminology. Uh, so we use layers to re to mean something else. Um, and so these become these sort of get uh, stacked together, and uh, then the weights that correspond to that new volume themselves have the have a have a have, a, um, have 96 planes, and those are the weights that that get slid across. The, this new volume in, in um, the next round of convolution. Now, because they have more than, well, it was really, for us, it's really convenient when the, when the uh, weights have three planes, because then we can just use red, green, blue to visualize them. Once they have 96, uh, a depth of 96, we can no longer do that. So that kind of makes it a little uh, harder to, to visualize. Uh, but it basically works in the, in the same way. And so at each step of the network, there's a, um, a volume is generated. So there's kind of a volume in the beginning, that's the input volume. And, if, and at every round, we have a volume um, of a different d dimension. Uh, sorry, of a, of, a different, um, of a different shape. And, um, and also, yeah, so let's talk about convolution. Um, the recall that convolutional neural networks inherit everything that neural networks have. So everything we've learned about neural networks, feature abstractions, weights, uh, it still applies to convolutional neural networks. The only difference is that in CubNets, there are two new types of layers. And the complicated one is convolution, which we're looking at, and then I'll also talk about pooling in a second. So recall with convolution, we take these, fee uh, these weight maps, or I should call them just filters. So, so sometimes you'll hear filters, um, weights, um, 
or even some le less commonly you'll he'll, 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 you'll hear kernels, um, but but we can talk about them as filters for the most part. Uh, and every response that we get is a single pixel in the feature in what this is called a feature map, which is a uh, a dot product of the the weight the filter being multiplied by the subset of the image that it, that we happen to be on. And so in the demo, you'll see that we generate. Uh, oops. We generate a whole bunch of these, and then uh, and then there's one more operation. This is just normalizing, not, not a big deal. So it's just kind of making everything have the same max brightness, and then pooling, which I'll describe in a second. But when we go to the next convolution, this has another set of weights, uh, but now these weights have the same uh, number of planes as whatever came out of this pooling layer. Uh, and then, but the, and so the only way that it changes this is that so we have a volume, not just a single layer. We have a we have a whole stack of these. The weight is similarly shaped. It ha it'll have the or exactly it has the same exact shape. It'll have the same number of planes. And then this dot product is not just across x y z. So it's not just this times this, this times this, this times this. It's it's that for every single plane and then sum together. So you'll still generate a one, uh, a flat plane, a single one from a single weight. Uh, but then because we'll have, again, we'll have many weights, uh, we'll generate a volume of these. So each of, each of the filters um, will generate one of these and then we stack them together. So uh, if you can kind of visualize this process end to end, we are kind of, um, we're destroying information as we go, basically, by doing this process of, of um, convolving. Like we, in each of these responses, we've lost the information of where the individual multiplication, like in the individual constituents of each multiplication, we've lost where that information has come from, uh, which is important. So we're, this is a kind of a destructive process, but it's also um, creating high, more, uh, sort of more high level information in some sense. Uh, yeah? So is this sort of like intentional destruction of information? Would that be kind of like analogous to like, I guess a mutation in genetics or something like that? Like there's an intentional error in order to like, like avoid, like, I guess you call it local like minimum or local maximum. Mm -hmm. uh, intentional, intentional error in what's that? What error? You know, like, I don't know, I'm trying to mm -hmm. Sort of mutation is sort of random. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Those that are best fit will be able to reproduce and expand that. Um, so I'm just trying to think: like, is, is the convolution sort of similar to creating? So like in genes, like that's sort of an intentional behavior. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is this sort of similar in the sense that, like, by creating some error, it helps to avoid? Like, I don't know if it's avoided, but like it, mm -hmm. it advances the understanding. Mm, there is, I guess you could say there is some sort of advancement of understanding. There's not really, I'm not sure, I'm struggling to see the error notion because there's sort of a, here there, it's, it's more like summarization rather than, than creating error. Um, but that's an interesting angle and I've, I would love to hear more about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so... Now then the other layer, and I didn't have this last time, so this will actually explain pooling really succinctly. So there's a second layer, and, this, and, and um, the pooling layer actually works much, simply, much more simply. So recall, like what we just said is we have a volume, right? So after this right here, the first convolution, in this case we have 96 in, uh, individual responses, uh, filter maps, sorry, feature maps. Uh, and so this, and I, I forget what, what size they are, they're like 220, these might be the same size as that, that visual, but, but basically like one of those filter, uh, one of those feature maps is, is like this slice right here. Uh, in this visual, there's 64 of them. In our case, that first convolution, there's 96, but it's basically the same thing. It's a volume and it looks like this. And after pooling, what we've done is we've reduced the, the X and Y uh, the number of dimensions in X and Y by half. They're still the same number of them, but we've basically downsampled them. 
So go. So one of these uh, gets downsampled by half, and it, and, it, and it does so in a really simple way. It just takes uh, every sort of group of four, and it grabs it. This is called max pooling. So it'll just take the, the biggest one. So for here, it's a six. For here, it's an eight. We talked about like um, there, there's different kinds of pooling schemes. So there's average pooling. So you could have just averaged these. But for whatever reason, experimentally, it's found that max pooling works best. Um, more recently, there's been some development of all convolutional, convolu uh, so, so fully convolutional neural networks where there's no pooling layers. So you can accomplish the same downsampling by using, we didn't talk about strides so much, but when we do these, um, when we do these filters, uh, they, we could be skipping by one if we want. And if we were skipping, then we'd have half as many. Uh, like if we, if we have a stride of two, so this would skip uh, two instead of one, then we would also be sort of getting the same effect. We'd be downsampling. So there's been some movement in making neural, uh, convolutional neural, neural networks just use convolutional layers. Uh, more interestingly, there's uh, using only binary features has been proposed. And so, yeah, a lot of this stuff is in constant flux. Um, and so we just got to sort of watch out for it. Uh, let me see where we are. Convolution pooling layers. Okay, so let's just go back to the demo. So again, as we do this, um, we do, we do a few more convolutions, and th this has a this particular neural network has the following architecture. Um, convolutional neural networks come in very different, very many architectures. So this architecture is the one of the uh, the best, uh, the winner of the uh, ImageNet competition in two thousand thirteen which is ZFNet, or I think it's um, maybe some, some modified version of it. So th it had this particular architecture where we have a convolution and a pooling, convolution pooling, three convolutions pooling in fully connected layers. There are other architectures that exist now, and actually the most recent um, winner of ImageNet competition had something like 150 uh, layers. Um, so yeah, they, they come in sort of lots of variety, and they're changing all the time. Just to yeah. just, uh, make sure I'm understanding right. The, the layers you're talking about, um, the pooling, like after they have been pooled, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they're being brought into the, as a layer, and you put that into the layer. Yeah, so like after pooling, you have one of, you'll have another volume. So that one, this one layer, could have been that's visualized. That one. The, uh, which one, sorry? This one, this right here, yeah, yeah. They, like this volume exists at a at a certain layer of the network. The whole the whole volume is the layer, not not that individual slice. Yes, the yes, slice yeah. Sorry, is like yeah. Plane in the volume, but the volume is the layer. Right, right. Sorry if that's not clear. Yeah, um, because yeah, we're using the word layer to mean many many things, I guess. Uh, but yeah, at a at a single layer, like like for example, after a convolution, after every stage of this, actually. So like. After all of these layers, or after all these operations, we have a volume, and the volume is what what you have at each stage, at each layer, basically a volume. So pooling does this to a volume; it'll just make it smaller. Uh, convolution will kind of reshape it altogether because it just depends on how many weights you have. So in the in the convolution, oh, I should really have a visual for for how this works with convolution. That that's for next week. Oh. <laughs> so, so yeah. That layer would be. Uh, you just multiply 112 by 112 by 64 to get a dimension. Uh, the layer would be that dimension. Like yeah, that, that's how many neurons you'd have at that layer. Yeah, you could. Yeah. Um, so that's how many neurons you have, like 112 times 112 times 64. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how many weights you have also. Um, yeah. And. Yeah, and at a convolution, like if this were a convolution instead of pooling, so let's say we had this volume and we were going through a convolution, then the weights, uh, the filter maps that we would use, that we would convolve this with. So, for example, let's say the the filter maps were five by five, and we had uh, ninety six of them. So one filter map, one uh, filter would be five times five times sixty four. So it would be uh, the same depth as the volume. We slide it across each x, y sort of position of that volume. 
and then it generates a single flat, e each filter generates a single flat um, plane, and then if we have 96 of them, we then stack those together, and then there's 96. So the volumes, if you do a convolution, they can change depth. So we can go from 64 to 96 uh, if we just have that many fil uh, filters in the next layer. So let that, let that sink in a little bit, yeah. <laughs> if you see this enough times, it'll, it'll, start, to, it'll start to absorb, uh, and a lot of insights will come out of that. The main thing that we want to really understand is what each of these dots really mean, right? So like, let's, let's go all the way to the end here. <clears throat> we saw that now, now they still have sort of a spatial correspondence, right? Because every single pixel is the result of repeated convolutions. And each convolution, so like at the first layer, it, it has multiple pixels, right? It's like a five by five map. At the next convolution, it will take that and merge it with, with a whole bunch of sort of overlapping, uh, overlapping subsets. So at each, at, each, um, at each layer, more of the original input image is influencing the, this, each of these points. And at the end, it's basically the whole image, more or less. So like each of these dots is a function of the whole image, a fully differentiable function of the full image. And they'll light up in various ways. So like one of these is, is looking for, you know, we were talking about like finding, um, let's actually go to the pooling layer. We were talking about finding um, one of these lights up for what seems like faces. Um, so it's like a face detector. I don't remember where it was. Um, different ones might light up like, I don't know, if we put the remote control. It would be interesting to see if we can find which of these is only lighting up for the remote control. That might be hard to find. Uh, but but you know, if, if it is, if it's lighting up for only the remote control, that tells us something about that neuron. That means it, it likes remote controls. It really wants to um, give off a high, activa uh, high activation when there's a remote control. Mm -hmm. Does one neuron correspond to one pixel? Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. And so these are like uh, interpretations of the whole image. And when you say that whole, like that you're finding one of these images to be interpreting a, a face, like would that be the only thing that 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 you could make sense of uh, of that interpretation, or could you say like, oh, that this is actually looking for purple bears. <laughs> mm -hmm. It could be looking for purple bears, yeah. Um, it, it's look, it tries to find things that are, remember the, that these, the weights themselves come from training. And we've talked very little about training, which is, which is one of these sort of, that's the elephant in the room. Um, but uh, yeah, that's how training is done. Uh, but through the process of training, the weights are discovered. And the weights and training is trying to optimize classification accuracy. And f to do that, it wants to find weights which are describing features that are useful for classification. So at every layer, we're acquiring high, a higher level representation of the object. And, and li like we just saw here, these are lighting up for faces, right? Um, or other sorts of objects. That is really useful for the final layer because then it's much easier to, like, uh, at the end here, we have a fully connected layer, right? So it's just like one of our normal neural networks that we saw before. But the input neurons, instead of be being, um, instead of being like pixels, just the original pixels, they um, actually have more uh, higher level meanings. So one of these might be a face. Like one of these, maybe this one right here, you know, because it seems to be pretty consistent. Like I have the mouse over it. I, I'm making, I don't know if that one actually is, I'm just, but just as an example, like this is finding something consistently in the image that is of a high level sort of, um, a high level feature, like a face or a collar or a, you know, sunglasses or something like that. Mm -hmm. Just one more. If, if, so so uh, how, how much? 
Uh, how high frame rate? What's the frame rate of that updating? Oh, this is uh, it's like two a second or something. Second. Yeah. That is your computer? Is that yeah. This this uh, implementation is in open frameworks. It's of a convolutional neural network, so it's to do the um, to do a forward pass takes about that long, at least using OFXCCV. Um, there's a yeah a ton of computation that's happening. I think different implementations are probably a little faster, maybe. Um, but yeah, this is. There's also some overhead in drawing the image and things like that. So basically, it also like down the image taken from the webcam mm -hmm. to two frames a second. Yeah. So it takes a snap. Oh well, it, yeah. It's just going as you know. Every, it, yeah, it's going as soon as, as soon as it's ready for another one. It'll take a snap. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so. So once we're here, like at FC0, at this fully connected layer, it's as though we are back to, um, it basically, yeah, it's, it's like, like the last, the first fully connected layer in that convolution neural network is like this, basically. Or let's actually, let's talk about the very last fully connected layer is basically like this, right? It's the layer right before the classification. But what's nice about it is that each of these neurons preceding the classification now carry a lot more information. And so it's easier for a neural network to create a, um, a representation of each class using this sort of high level information. So if these, for example, if one of these classes is a person and these neurons mean eye, eyes, noses, glasses, legs, you know, if you have if some of a subset of those neurons contains that information, then we can imagine that it becomes easy to, uh, like, let's say this neuron that I have right here over the mouse, it's the person class. Then the weights coming from those prior objects, eyes, legs, hair, so on, are very high. And so this will, this will have a correspondingly high activation and so it will classify person. So that's really the essence, if, you, if nothing else, is that we are, um, I should really get rid of this joke, actually. This is, I've used this at so many talks. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, yeah, the, at the end, we really basically have this, right? So we can do a classification based on these high lev level features. And the essence of a convolutional neural network is that each of these dots is corresponds to some high level feature and it makes a lot of it makes certainly makes classification more more accurate and we'll see that these objects these activations besides for being useful for classification are useful for a lot of other things too because of this high level information that they carry and we're going to start to see that in more applications um, let me see here. Uh, active, yeah, so that's sort of what the activations are, right? And and I've been using, I usually use activations. Sometimes you'll hear responses or um, or features, things like that. They're, they're all kind of interchangeable. Uh, and so yeah, these carry. That that's the main thing you should understand about about covenants uh, is that the neurons carry high level information, and in particular, this last layer. Prior to classification, this the FC1 here, the last fully connected layer, has the most high-level information in the network prior to doing classification. And we're going to see that this layer right here, these these this these dots, are really really magical. <laughs> Actually, we'll see in a bit. Um, okay. So now let's. How are we doing? Four ten in this class start. Three thirty. That took forty minutes. Okay. Time to time to speed up. <laughs> uh, okay, let's pass on through this. Okay, just yeah. Um, I'll show you the. Yeah, I get, I'll just just because this is in this order, I'll I'll just show you. Like I think I showed this before. Like okay, I can take a picture of a remote control or something. And remote control, and then it'll search Instagram. Okay, I just wanted to show this out of order because we. And it searches Instagram for remote controls. I don't. I think I have a. I have a bug here. I don't know why it keeps on taking a picture. It should stop. Uh, okay. I'll fi I'll fix this later. 
Uh, yeah, this is one of the, the different applications that I, I, I intend to show in the applications. Um, we looked at this before, I want to skip that. Okay, let's talk about interpretations of these activations, like what they mean a little more closely. Um, so, at every layer we have these, at every layer we have these weights, right? And there's a lot of things, you know, when we're looking at that demo and we just have these activations, it may seem uh, very abstract, but there's a number of things that we can do to make a little more, uh, a little, get a little bit more high level information that is interesting to us. And I'm going to show you um, one of the first attempts to do that uh, was from this paper in 2013 called uh, about visual visualizing convolutional neural networks. It's made by Matt Zada and Rob Fergus here at NYU actually. And, um, and one thing, and, and the fairly obvious thing we can do is, you know, for the first layer, we have these, these weights, right? So you see in the top left corner here, we have a series of weights, um, those, those filters. And when we slide them across the image, every subset of the image will have a different response to it. One thing we might want to ask is, which, uh, which subsets of the image have the highest response? Right, so if we, if we slide these, and they're really small, right? they're only 5 by 5 pixels, so they'll only line up with small subsets of each image. And the question is, where, in the original input image, where do they have the highest activation? So in the image just below, this one right here, these are subs, um, subsets of images which respond very highly to each of these. So you see there's 9 of them, right? There's 3 by 3. And then this grid is... 3 by 3 also, and each of these, like the first, the top left um, segment has nine subset images, which all responded very highly to that very top left uh, weight, right? And they're, they're actually from actual images. And you see that they all sort of roughly resemble the filters. The filters are looking for... for uh, things that are sort of sympathetic to themselves, right? Um, now, when we go to the next layer, it becomes a little harder to do this because the filter, um, now that we're two convolutions in, the filter it is not being slid over the original input image. It's being slid over the responses, the, 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 the first volume that came out of the convolution. But you still can figure out which part of the original image uh, was responsible for that activation because they're still spatially arranged. So like if we, let's, let's actually go back to the demo. Okay, so like here, if we go to the first convolution, right, each of these pixels are a function of some group of 5 by 5 pixels, right? So that's easy enough. Now here though, now these are um, functions of this right here, uh, but they're still spatially arranged. So like if there's a filter that gets applied to, to each of these, to this big volume from, from there, then you can, then the, each of the elements for that part of the volume that gets multiplied by the filter, all of those were a function of some prior pixels in the input volume. I know we're start, it's starting to get a little, this is what I mean by it's getting a little hairy. Um, so basically what I mean to say is that you can still trace in this con, con1 layer, you can still see like for any of these pixels that it applies to some subset of the original image, which is now bigger, right, because the, uh, uh, slightly bigger anyway, because the original, those inputs were themselves of a, of, they were, you know, oriented, um, they were, you know, like in the first in the first layer, they were five by five, so they'll at least be five uh, pixels out from each corner. Does that make sense? Are you, are you <laughs> saying like even though we're subsampling down, we can still because it's still based on like the distance and the grid shape, we can trace it back to where yeah. the original image. Yeah. Right, right, right. It's responsive. And so you can still do this. Uh, basically, you can still figure out each. Um, like for original, so this is layer two now, and the subsets of images that these 
uh, that these particular filters are responding to, you can still trace back to the original image. So we're looking at, in, on the right here, we're looking at actual images that respond highly to these neurons, right? Now they're bigger now, and what's interesting about them uh, is that they now seem to have like combinatorial properties of the original filters. Like this one, for example, looks like it's finding a number of vertical uh, lines, right? And that could be some combination, uh, uh, like, because there, for each of these, there's 16, uh, like, there's six, we're looking at 16 weights, and each of them, and there's nine samples for each one. That's why the greatest shape the way it is. There's like 16 of these boxes, and each one corresponds to a single filter weight. And then there's nine samples of images that reacted highly to that filter. And you can see they all you know, have some resemblance to each other. And they're kind of more high level than these. So these are very simple. They're you know, just like gradients, edges, lines. These are like, you know, it looks to me like this one is looking for some semicircle coming from the left. Right? And you can almost imagine a way, you can almost imagine a way of getting from there to here by, by having, um, by like weighting different filters more than others. Something Just to clarify, mm -hmm. yeah. these three by three grids, mm -hmm. which ones? Uh, uh, the one on the far upper right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. These are just from multiple images where it's isolation of parts of the texture. Yeah. They responded. They're not all from one image. No, no, they're not. Yeah, they're from 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 any image. For, they're from. I don't. I don't remember exactly, but basically, they're they're from some images. They might be from the same. Some maybe they're from the same images, but they're basically subsets of images that respond highly to that filter. Okay. Uh, How were filters made? Uh, they're made through training, uh, which we've talked about very little. The filters are derived uh, by the network in training in such a way as to maximize classification accuracy, which is why they end up having perceptually relevant features to us because we're trying to classify different objects which are perceptually meaningful to us and the network learns how to do that. Um, which is magic still, I think. Yeah. And, and it's kind of like, it feels like there's so much purpose to it, you know, finding faces, but it, it um, but it's really just done as a means to an end, which is to maximize classification accuracy. Um, this thing I'll talk about in a second, the, like the thing on the left here, these weird images, um, it's called deconvolution, which is another thing that we'll, we'll mention. Uh, but let's just go down the layers. You'll see like now as we go through the layers, they start to become more complicated uh, and bigger again. So like this weight right here, uh, this filter is looking for, it looks like almost like grids, like repetitive grids, like of hexagons and, and diamonds. Um, this one, you know, some of them are easier to interpret than others. Like here, you can kind of see that, that like one, this looks like a thumb or something and this is a, a cup. So like, what do these things have in common? Well, they, they seem to have some sort of a, like an orientation in common. There's like a, almost like a cylinder. Like maybe this is almost like finding cylinders. It's hard to say, and you can kind of judge. Um, this one's interesting. It's finding, seems to be finding like torsos of people. So, so you can see that even in some of the low layers, you'll start to get high layer, high level features. Um, this may not actually be, it's not necessarily the case that it is uh, responding to people. It could be responding to something that is also in all of the, maybe it's responding to shirts. It's like it's, it's, you can't necessarily assume um, that it's not, that it's not just shirts. Um, you see people, but it might just be some part of that is making it fire. This one's pretty clearly finding dogs. Um, you know, we can go down and they just get more and more complicated. So that, that's kind of like, that, and that's a really necessary thing to understand about these activations. They're looking, um, they, they um, the original input image, uh, they are finding things in that original input image. And these, and the way we can figure out what that is, is just one easy way of figuring that, that out is looking for parts of images that maximally activate each of these filters. And at each layer, they become progressively more abstract until at the very final layer, they're basically just classifications. So this is a way to, to visualize the different layers. 
it, it's a way to understand what the filters are doing, what they're what they're looking for, you know, what's causing them to be high, um, and it's coming from the original image. <clears throat> um, image patches. Okay, so um, I'll talk about decomv in, in just a bit. Um, another thing that's related is you can you can kind of look for this is an experiment you can do where suppose you have this image of a Pomeranian, right? And um, and, it, and it's late, the, the network is able to classify it as such. Uh, but you then do this experiment where you take a little window, like a gray window or a black window, and you slide it across the image to occlude part of it. And then you measure how, um, like the response of the Pomeranian neuron or the Pomeranian classification and when and you can kind of see, like for example, if we take this right here and we put it right in front of its face, this heat map right over here shows us the classification, the probability of it being classified as a Pomeranian, and it drops when you block its face. And this is kind of a way for us to see uh, <clears throat> which parts of the image are most responsible for particular neurons' activations. So this is kind of a, another neat, neat trick for visualizing what these things are doing. Um, this one right here, okay, it's a car wheel. So if we block the car wheel part of it, which is here, the classification drops a lot. This, is, this one's really interesting right here, the third one. Um, the label for this is actually Afghan hound. So this is the main part of the image. It's this Afghan hound dog. And the classification accuracy of this the probability of it being labeled as an Afghan hound actually increases if we occlude this guy's face, right? So it's actually, if we occlude the face, the Pomeranian's accuracy goes, it goes higher. And then that should make sense because this is almost a distraction. Like maybe a part of the network is actually trying to classify it as a, as a man or something like that. Uh, and if we occlude the man, then more of the focus is going to Afghan hounds. So this is kind of a, a neat way of uh, figuring that out. I made, I actually just made this, oh, shit. <laughs> um, I had a demo, but I seem to have broken it. Why did, is it? Oh, because, oh, probably because this image is no longer exists. Image load, image path. Let me just quickly, move bird. image I'll just make sure that it's loading uh, at all times okay let's go back to that nope. okay I hope that works Okay, this seems to be working. So this is a live demo, I made this today. So like this is a hummingbird. Now it's actually uh, classified as a chickadee. So what this demo is showing is the um, classifications as we include different parts of it. So like if I include this, uh, this entire thing, it becomes a quill. That kind of makes sense, right? It looks like a quill now uh, because we've occluded the head of the, of the bird. Um, and otherwise it stays a, ch a, a chickadee. And we can try this with different images. Um, another thing we can do is actually we can do the opposite and occlude the other way around. So like if we make a sort of a porthole. So now if we do this, now a hummingbird is actually very high. So for whatever reason, when we don't occlude the whole thing, the thing, it looks to me like a hummingbird. I don't have the actual label, but, um, but it gets misclassified as a chickadee for whatever reason because of the background. Maybe has some more, uh, is found in more of the chickadee photos. Uh, and then when we look at just this, this we, we actually get a pretty good match for Hummingbird. And we can look at different parts of it. Lampshade. <laughs> Matchstick wing. Um, we can try this with different images. So I was like toying with this earlier. So centipedes, dolphins, ducks. Anyone ha uh, 
That's a weird looking duck. <laughs> Let's try the elephant. Is this... Oh, no, I broke the demo too. Okay. I'll show... <laughs> it's just a hung... Okay, I'll, I'll fix this later. And we'll... It's just a fun little demo. And, and this is part of OFXCCD, so if you guys want to implement covnets in open frameworks, this demo, uh, as of today, is, is um, part, of, part of that repo. Uh, okay. Let's just go back to the notes real quick. Inclusion, classification, accuracy. Um, so I'll kind of, yeah, want to get into visualization. So let me just say a few quick things about this that we're, we're just going to kind of breeze through this. Um, uh, these, the things that we were looking at are very much useful for other tasks. So one of the, the tasks that we've been principally concerning ourselves with is um, classification of images. But you can see that the activations, because of all the information that they carry uh, and sort of different combinatorial properties of them, there's a bunch of other applications which are also useful. So one that um, there's also a competition for is image localization. So localization means um, not just finding the classification of an image, but also finding the, the bounding box of that object within the image. So the ImageNet competition that has as a classification competition, but it also has a classification plus localization where you have to do both at the same time. So find the thing that you're classifying and where in the image it actually is. And that's something that is um, a big er uh, area of, of research. Um, you can imagine that what, what we've been doing, like you can almost see from looking at these that this is kind of a way of doing segmentation also. Um, so these, the way that the different um, pixels grouped together, not occluded, respond can be a source of information that's useful for segmenting uh, the image as well. We're not going to talk about segmentation really carefully, but, but just, just to be aware that that's something that's used. These are also the basis of like what's called um, attention modeling. So like, can you figure out what the foreground or, and the background of an image is? Um, and it turns out that you can do a pretty good job using, using some of the information that you see from here. So that's localization, segmentation, attention. Um, I mentioned this briefly when we talked about stranger images. Uh, and, and just to save time, I want to I wanna kind of just uh, say uh, just a few words about it. So what's, what's another interesting thing, another interesting aspect about convolutional neural networks is that every layer is a function of the preceding layer and nothing else, right? So if we're doing this demo, right, if we're in the middle of the camera demo, uh, this, you know, so con4 is only a function of what's of this volume right here, right? So once we're here, we could, pretend, we could discard all the information that we have here, the filters, the, the weights, the, the responses, and just take this volume and, and get, we have all the information we need, right? So we're discarding information as we go, if we want. Um, so what's interesting about that, uh, a question you might want to ask is, when we're, if we discard the information, what do we lose? And what's, what's um, you know, what is the nature of this uh, information destruction? And, and um, one thing, one lens to sort of uh, think about it through is, is um, in the application of compression which is sort of doing the same thing, right? So one thing you could potentially do, and I don't know if anyone's actually doing this in practice, is you could use convolutional neural networks for compression. Uh, so for example, if we do a forward pass and we get all these activations, the amount of information here is less, you know, once we get to here, it's just 4,096 numbers, right? So it's less than the information that's here. So the question you might want to ask is, can you reconstruct the original image from, from the activations of some layer. And it should make sense that you could to some degree because a lot of the information is preserved. Um, so a lot of the information is destroyed, right? So when you do max pooling, you don't save which of the pixels that max came from. <clears throat> but if you do, uh, and, and similarly for convolution, when you do the dot product, you destroy the information of where the individual pixels were, 
but from many dot products, you might be able to reconstruct it back. And so there's research into, into like, can you reconstruct the original image from, a, from, a, from the responses? And if you can, it would be useful for compression, right? Because then we could like save this and then go backwards. We can decode, um, you know, we can encode the image as the activations and then decode it back to the image. Um, is that possible? It turns out that it's actually really difficult in covenants. They're not really designed for, um, for compression, but there's like, you can, uh, I, don't, I don't have the images here, but you can, you can kind of re reconstruct the or, or parts of the original image. You can at least recognize things that are in it sometimes. Um, so, so, and that's important because, for example, if we have some sort of a service that uses convolutional neural networks um, to save uh, some sort of a representation of an object, uh, you might be thinking of different sort of privacy issues. Like if you can infer from the activations what was in the original image, um, then that's uh, then then privacy becomes an issue, right? Like if we if we're using some service that that claims that it destroys the information when it does the encoding process, well maybe you can still get it back. So like if you if if these encodings are compromised in the in a security breach or something, um, maybe some of the underlying information can actually be re re um, recovered. Um, so I obviously like that's a really really high level. Um, explanation of a very interesting topic. Um, so if anyone like if that sounds interesting to people, should definitely research it. There's there's been some writing about it that I'm not super aware of. Um, so and it's definitely a very fascinating area. So that that could be an interesting thing to look into. Yes. Do you know? I mean, it, it seems like an analogy, but I don't know if there's actually any correspondence. But the stuff like, that they're doing with for brain visualization, where like I watch a video and then they're reading sort of the brain readout to then reconstruct the video. Have you seen mm -hmm. some of this stuff? I haven't seen that, no. I wonder if that's at all, whether they're using any of these techniques or if it's just, it seems like an analogy at least to that idea. So do I understand you correctly? So they're, they're, um, they're analyzing the, the brain uh, responses and then trying to reconstruct the image that they're looking at? That's yeah. really interesting, yeah. And it, I mean, it essentially the point that they're at sounds like what you're describing when they're reconstructing where, you know, like if it's watching a film and there's like a person on the screen, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll see a shape that's like roughly, like they can't, and it's not at the point where it's high fidelity and you can tell what film yeah. you're watching, but it's at least like a shape and the motion of the shape follows it. And, and like are they game. also looking at like where the person's eyes are pointing to? Is that information? That's a good question. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think it actually has to do with that. I think it's just... Just three smart. Really, that's very interesting, yeah. Yeah. I don't know anything about that. That yeah. sounds super interesting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, okay, so... Okay, so let's go back to the slides. It's broken. Okay. Really got to get rid of that lobster. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, we didn't really say much about decomp. Okay, so just going back to this visualization. Um, in uh, so these things in which we haven't talked about at all, this these grayish looking things, um, they're the result of a process called deconvolution, which was introduced in the same paper. And there's there's a few different flavors of this. So what deconvolution is doing, and I have myself have only a very topical understanding of deconvolution, but it's basically in it. You can almost see what they what they are. Like they look like. It's almost like drawing the thing from the image. So each of these have a one-to-one -one correspondence. So this right here, where my mouse is, the corresponding deconv is this. So it's kind of reconstructing uh, the an image that generated that is responsible for creating that high activation, but isn't it, it isn't just looking at what the image looks what the original input image is. It's actually trying to like give you almost the essence. It's almost giving you like the essence of the object being rec recognized by the, by the activations. This will be probably look a little more obvious like when we look at these. Right, you can see like the dogs. So this face looks like this one, right? And it's kind of, and the process it does so is done in one step. So you forward pass the image 
and then you have these activations and there's a way of basically uh, a sort of like almost like a modified backpropagation scheme. We haven't talked about backprop, so, so don't worry. Uh, but basically there's a way to kind of generate these and I haven't seen very many good implementations of this, but this is basically uh, an interesting technique for visualization uh, that it's uh, discovering sort of these these um, the the parts of the image that are um, like almost the essence of the neuron and what it's finding. That's kind of the best. I know it's very very abstract explanation. It's kind of the best I can do. Um, that's decon. Then there's a technique that's related to it called guided back propagation, which I think actually these might be that. These might not be decon. They, they might be guided back. back. I don't remember. But they're related techniques that basically re make these images in a single pass. Um, more interesting is when we start to talk about image synthesis, um, which which is kind of like basically we're, we're getting into deep gene territory. Um, let me just see if there's anything I want to say about decon back backprop. Is it almost like when you get down to like the subsampling where you find things that are having a high level of activation, you kind of like move back towards upsampling and like hi highlighting those areas that were activating? You're, yeah, that's one one part of it. Yeah, this is sort of like trying to re re up like um, and upsampling itself is actually like an interesting thing that people are trying to do with neural networks. Like, can you figure out from all the different activations like where where did those original um, information where was the information that was destroyed? Like, can you recover it um, through upsampling? Um, Actually, so it's 4.40, so let's, let's just take a break, uh, and then we'll get into image synthesis. And, yeah, we're, so um, let, let's keep it, like, uh, reasonable. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, if you just start. I'm yeah, I'll just start, start, yeah. I, yeah, I'll start really soon. Everybody hurry up. Okay, um, we'll see you in a couple minutes. For the second half of the class today, we're going to talk about a few more applications of covnets and I think the ones that we'll have time for are basically like the ones that have to do with synthesizing images so that's deep dream and style transfer which everyone's really uh, everyone really loves and I'll talk about TSNI which is um, uh, sort of an unrelated technique that we can apply to co covnets to do some interesting things for data visualization and 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 um, data organization more generally and uh, if we have time uh, we'll talk a little bit about the, the deep learning platforms. I think this might might be something we have to put away until next week. Uh, and also talk about what transfer learning, and I have an example of that as well. So the cool thing about um, Deep Dream, and I, I introduced Deep Dream uh, very quickly in the first week. Well, what's really interesting about Deep Dream is that it's actually it's almost obvious in retrospect. It's one of those things that like seems so magical, but once you know everything you know about covenants, and in particular all the stuff we're talking about today, then Deep Dream uh, kind of is almost ob is the almost obvious thing to do, um, and it's actually pretty straightforward. So, like the hard thing is to understand what these activations are, but once you have a good grasp on that, then understanding Deep Dream is actually not not too much more work. Um, so, the first thing we want to talk about to understand Deep Dream is the idea of synthesizing images which have particular activation responses. So, I'm going to just shoot, get the demo back going. Um, okay. So, again, just, just to tie, tie things together, so like we have these activations, right? And every, uh, the activations are divided as neurons among a bunch of layers as we've seen, and um, you can really do, uh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, you can, <laughs> let me, what's going on in this thing? You know what I'll do, I'll just skip it real quick. Fix that. Okay, so um, one of the cool things, actually this is not really that, um, let's just get into, the, you'll, you'll see when we talk about 
visual, um, synthesizing images. So that's part of the deep dream process. Um, so deep dream emerged from this um, from Google basically, and they and the, I mentioned this in the first week. They they kind of leaked it on Reddit, and then uh, a week later they posted an implementation in Cafe. And what deep dream um, what they started with was an explanation of, of actually all the stuff that we were just talking about. Uh, these activations and, and um, image classification and what you can do with it. And they talked first about the notion that these activations, uh, you can synthesize images which maximally activate particular, uh, particular neurons, right? So when we were looking at the demo, we saw neurons that would be activated for faces or for wheels or for, you know, eyeballs or whatever. And uh, a question that you could ask is, what image would, would achieve, uh, like, would make the eyeball activation through the roof? You know, like, what would have a, what, what image that if you did a forward pass of it through a com covenant would have a very high activation for, for different classes, right? Like, uh, and, you know, we don't... When you actually send an actual image through a covenant, the activations will be kind of dispersed, right? So like the classification is never, never like a hundred percent, you know, the class that it is, and then zero percent of everything of everything else. There's other things in the image which are kind of trying to trip up the network. Um, so the question is, can you find, uh, can you create images which achieve certain uh, desired responses? So for example, if you have a network which one of the one of the classifications it can make is heart beast which is some some animal right that, that we're all vaguely familiar with uh, can you what would be the image which would achieve a very very high uh, response in heart beast and low on everything else and one such image looks kind of like this and when you look at it you'll see sort of like heart beast junk you know like pixel junk that kind of would make a neural network think that there's uh, that it's a picture of a heart beast, um, and some of these are a little more obvious than others. Like the banana one, kind of makes sense, right? Like you see a whole bunch of what looks like bananas, right? They they really more or less look like bananas, um, and they're also like they're all over the image, right? There, so the the if you have some process of generating these and it wants to maximize the response to banana, it's going to try to fill up as much of the pixel space as possible with bananas. And so that's what you're seeing. Uh, this is starfish, ants, and these are all completely gen like just generated, right? They're not real images, obviously. Um, some of these classes are interesting, right? The parachutes. It seems to have a person attached to it, and that's because the images that it was trained on, people tend to be attached to parachutes. So if you have a classifier that's looking for parachutes, it probably understands that there's often the person, you know, uh, attached to it. Uh, screws, and you can kind of see the the, the the um, sort of elements of screws and so on. Um, and the way that these are produced is through a process of um, sort of an iterative process of optimization. And we'll actually see a few more examples of this, uh, a few slides from here. Uh, what it does is you, um, you might start, so what, like a typical way of starting is to have basically white noise, so an image that is just, just noise. And then you and then you feed it through a neural network, and then if you want for it, like let's take the banana one for example, we want it to have a very high response for banana and very low for everything else. If we give white noise to the network, it won't have that, right? It'll just have activations that are sort of all over the place. And what you do is you change the pixels all very slightly, such that the response, the activation for banana goes up and the other activations go down. And the way that's done, and this is, we're gonna talk about it really quickly just because we haven't really talked very much about training, so, um, so a lot of this is going to be, um, and actually part of, the, part of the book that this is all, the notes are coming out of, we'll have a chapter on training. Uh, it's not ready yet, so, uh, but hopefully that will supplement later what we kind of gloss over in this class, which is sort of a necessary thing. Uh, but in training, um, there, uh, what happens is like we derive, um, like for each step, uh, let's skip training and I'll just mention like the way, okay, it's getting to back to the banana. You feed the, the white noise image into the network. You have these responses 
And there is a way to figure out how to change the pixels such that the weights uh, change in the way that you want, uh, such that the activations change in the way you want. And it's using some uh, quantity called the gradient. We haven't talked about gradients at all, but you'll, you'll hear that a lot in machine learning. A gradient is actually just a, a, a terminology from, from like multivariable calculus and math. Uh, it is the quantity, it's a vector. So like if you have a, a function, which is a function of many variables, the gradient is basically the partial derivative of that function with respect to each of the variables. So it's a vector and it denotes sort of how much does the function, it's the, it's the derivative, right? So each one is like how much does the function change with respect to each variable in isolation. Um, that's a quantity like if you've taken calc, you know, like what I think typically it's like calc three, like in college, it's usually the third semester of calculus, you'll learn about gradients or maybe even before that, I'm not, I don't remember anymore. Uh, but, um, but gradients are uh, used to, to not just for this, but actually in training as well. So the gradient in the case of training a network tells you how much, because the, the um, like, it, so remember the gradient is uh, a property of a function of many variables. So in this, in the case of training, our function is a loss function. It's like um, the accuracy. You can derive a sort of loss, like how, how dissatisfied are you with the, with the um, network's performance? And then the variables are the weights. So that's really, we, when you're training a network, you're trying to optimize this loss formula, and it's a function of all these weights. So the gradient is a vector of the derivative of the loss with respect to all of the weights uh, in, individually. To derive this is to figure out how to change the weights because it's telling you like how much will the loss change if you adjust the weight. So if you know that for each variable, you can adjust them all such that the weight goes down. Basically, you just go against the gradient, basically. Um, that's obviously like a five second explanation for something that we, we should probably take a whole class to cover. Uh, but just to be at least topically familiar with it will help, uh, will help understand some of this stuff. Um, gradients are useful for, for this as well, because here now we can, we can figure out a different kind of gradient, which is a gradient with respect to the pixels instead of the weights. So the gradient in this case tells us how much will the activation to banana change uh, with respect to changing each of the pixels slightly. So if we figure that out, we can change all of the pixels slightly to make the response to banana higher. And you can't do it all in one jump for reasons that, again, are also just beyond the scope of today's course. Uh, but you can do it through this iterative process. And it's solved using super complex optimization libraries that are very much beyond my understanding and, and beyond the scope of the course. Uh, so there's kind of multiple components to this. So that's what is happening here. So then what's Deep Dream? <coughs> Deep Dream is instead of starting with a noise image, you start with an actual image. So like, like this photo of whatever these are, gazelles or something. Um, you feed it in, you observe the activations, and then this is the way Deep Dream works, uh, using what we just learned. You feed, the, you feed the network an image, it observes all of these activations, and then it will uh, it'll calculate a gradient with respect to the pixels, of um, of like of the activations, and then it will change the activations to basically enhance. It will try to enhance all of the high activations that it sees, and attenuate all the low ones. So, uh, and the way it's done is actually like if you look at the the code that um, Google released, it actually basically happens in like three lines of code. It just takes the the act uh, the gradient, and it sets it to be equal to the activations. That won't make much sense if, if you're not familiar with gradients too much, but basically if you change the pixels in such a way as to, uh, with like, uh, so that they're equal to the, that's a good way to, <laughs> uh, I just don't want to confuse you guys more. Um, let, let, let's kind of take a step back and, and forget about the whole activate, uh, gradient equals activations. Uh, the, the, if you look at the code and, the ex and actually Google's blog post too, um, that might make a little more sense. But what it does is it effectively changes the pixels so that it amplifies the activations that it found. So here, um, now, now there's a couple sort of degrees of freedom here. 
you when when we when you say enhance the activations, one thing you might want to ask is well, which ones, right? There's activations at every layer. So if you have it, um, if you choose to enhance the very low layer activations, the ones that are just the, uh, a response of the first filters, you know, the edges and the gradients and so on, then uh, you will get images that look like this, right? It starts to find, it'll find edges and it'll find these sort of like, you know, it'll find edges and it'll find gradients and whatever else the other, those filters are looking for. And it will change the pixels so that those activations go higher. Uh, if you instead choose to enhance the high layer activations, or, or I, should, I, shouldn't, I should say the later, just in case high and low isn't clear. In fact, sometimes I think I misuse it myself. Um, but like the layer, like the high, high level features, if you want to enhance those instead, then you'll see um, things like this, right? These start to look like the actual classes. They're like more complicated objects. And so it, and the nice thing to do is do it in the sky. And, you know, all of us that have, like, you know, you see a cloud in the sky and it looks like something, right? So feed Deep Dream some images of clouds and it will see faces or it will see dogs or birds and it will adjust the pixels so as to make those more visible. And you start to see things like this. So mm -hmm. you fit in, so you have a training floor of a cloud and you put Fox in and it will try to make it look like the uh, it, sorry, if you put what in it? So it's like a cloud like truck plus activation. Mm -hmm. And if you put something else in it, it will try to make it into a cloud. If you enhance that particular you know, like yeah, if you enhance that particular layer, which is looking for clouds, I guess that would make it look more like a cloud. Yeah, uh, or like if you feed an image of a cloud and it finds an image of a fox. It will try to make it more fox-like. So no, no synthesis. Sorry, sorry. No synthesis. Syn synthesis? Yeah. No, it, it well, it is synthesis in the sense that it well, it's synthesis. It's starting from a from an actual image, but then it's changing it. So maybe it's not synthesis in the sense of like from scratch, but but it's um, like these come from from images of clouds. Um, I'll back up to that. So like for example this this image of like if you take this image of, of Vishnu um, which which I deep dreamed uh, you know this is the original image you deep dream it and this happens right so like you see that like suddenly oops, suddenly like you look at the bottom right here especially like suddenly there's these weird snail leg things happening and like a fish in, in his hand and uh, and you can, and the thing is, Deep Dream is iterative, right? So, like, like I described the process that it's it adjusts the pixels very slightly to enhance the activations. So you can do it as many times as you want. So, like, if you do this once or a couple of times, let's say, I don't remember how many iterations this is, maybe like five or ten steps, and then do it do it some more. You'll see it like really like it just doubles down on what it finds. And then it just the whole image becomes saturated with deep dream artifacts. So this is kind of the process. It's an iterative process. So it just you know you can kind of choose how much you want to adjust the pixels, um, and and that's that's basically what what it's doing. This, and, like, this thing is like how computer seeing the original picture, and then because this is like. The Covnet was trained for classification, but but there but what we're seeing is that all of these activations they have um, they have more meaning that can be exploited in various ways. So now we're not doing any classification at all. It was trained to classify, so like that sort of knowledge is embedded in. They are trained, you know. They, I, I mean, like I feel like in the like possible like features and shapes and after. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 exactly. So it's like actually these, like, you know, like solving features, things, it's like what computer parts is like, uh, see in this picture. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's like, um, what's that word, paradelia or something? When you, is there a word, what's the word that, like, when you see things that aren't, you see faces, for example, people see faces in moon rocks. 
Uh, it's kind of like that for computers. So here, you know, when you look at this seashell, I don't see a whatever that is there. Uh, but but the thing about Deep Dream is that it jumps on any exit, like even if it sees it just a little bit. And it, it'll have some activations for even white noise. It'll have something. So whatever it is that it sees, this is just this process for kind of amplifying it until, until we really bring it out of the network. And this is like, okay, so you can see like this one right here, I'm enhancing the, the, like the edge filters, the really low, la the first layer. Uh, and, you, and that's kind of like in DeepDream, you can do that. In the, in the, anyway, in the source code that, that Google released, that is a, an option. So these are just a bunch of paintings. This is high layer features. And you can see that like it, it just, it's very opportunistic. You know, it just looks for, <laughs> you can basically see what it's doing. This is low layer features, fireworks, different rounds. This one's pretty groovy. I really love this one. <laughs> this is my favorite, I think. Uh, and this was, so this is like, so Mike Tycho is one of the, um, one of the uh, people at Google who worked on Deep Dream. And he did a lot of the initial like cool art experiments with it. So this is, I made this, but basically this is kind of uh, this video, but, but this was some, some of Mike Tycho's work. So basically he would take an image of white noise or, you know, just maybe like a blank image and then uh, feed it through the network, Deep Dream it, and then crop it and then deep dream it again, and then crop it, deep dream it again, crop it, and so on. And you can create these, these never ending, uh, like deep dream animations that look super cool. And actually, if we back up a little bit, looks at he, his, some of his initial work, he made images like this out of deep dream by feeding it pure noise. <coughs> so you would feed it pure noise and then maybe crop it a whole bunch of times. And then you would discover like a lot of really interesting, uh, intricate features. So this is kind of, all stuff that was done by by him, and um, the videos, yeah, they you'll see. There's tons of stuff on the web that looks basically exactly like this. <laughs> um, you can do. There's lots of different tricks that I tried with Deep Dream. So like, you can try to oscillate which layers to enhance. So you can enhance low layer features, and then and then try to enhance high layer features, and then it will it will sort of blow up whatever low layer features it found, and turn those into so you can kind of see, like, if you watch these enough, you'll see low layer features turning into high layer ones. Um, so I had a little bit of fun, fun with that. Um, you and so getting back to like the sort of uh, the the notion of synthesizing images from scratch, um, you can also use like we were looking at in the Google in the in the paper. You can um, you can see what classes are in the network by trying to. Um, synthesize images which respond to one neuron, right? So like the, the, the network that Google trained for, for Deep Dream uh, was trained on a whole bunch of, it was like, a, I think a data set of like a thousand images, right? And lots of them are different species of dogs and birds and fish. And that's why you see those in Deep Dream. And one interesting thing to do is to try to, um, try to visualize what those are by trying to synthesize images which maximally activate one of the one of the classifications and uh, zero to to the rest, so like you can do that with Deep Dream and this this visualization is made by Kyle, who will be here next week, and he made two of them. So you can see these are a bunch of the these are a bunch of the classes that are that that um, Google's sort of pre-trained network was was built on, and you can see these are really cool to to look at, right? So like this is sort of in the mind of Google's CubeNet. This is what a centipede would look like. So this image is, is, is synthesized to maximally activate the centipede, um, the centipede neuron. Kites and chickadees, uh, magpie, tree frog, garter snake, scorpion, and so on. So this is kind of neat, right? And uh, yeah. is this different than the banana measuring? Cup? No, uh, it's the same. Basically, the same principle. Okay. Trying to synthesize an image from from white noise, typically, uh, which maximally activates a single neuron. So Deep Dream is a little different because Deep Dream just tries to 
double down on whatever ones it finds, and it doesn't start with a noise image. You can feed a noise, uh, but it, um, like like as Mike Teika did, but it is trying to enhance whatever it finds. So enhance all of them basically. Here we're just trying to enhance one, and it's the final like the classification layer. Uh, and these are just some more visualizations that Mike Teika made. These are really super cool. There's a lot of um, and he write and you can find this in his blog. So he talks about some of the tricks that you can use. Um, some of the, the code that was used to do this, like uh, Deep Dream was made in Cafe, which is kind of this framework that was was pretty prominent for a while. I'll save this until for when we do more of a survey of the deep learning libraries, but um, a, a lot of the Deep Dream stuff has become much easier to, to do now using some of the things that came since since uh, Google's original code. Um, there's there's a couple of examples in Keras in particular, which I think are which I think are pretty easy to get started with, um, and we'll see all those later, pelicans and so on. Um, so yeah, pretty neat stuff. And uh, okay, so the next thing is style transfer. Uh, how are we doing on time? Uh, let me just see. Five fifteen. When do we? Five fifteen. Okay. Um, so next is style transfer, which we which we saw. So style transfer is basically you take now two images and you recompose one of them in the style of, of the other. So you take like a picture of the Mona Lisa and a picture of Picasso or, or Van Gogh and then you impose that style onto the Mona Lisa. So this one's a little trickier to understand, but but we can we can sort of get to a like let, let's call it the din dinner table uh, conversation understanding of, of style transfer. Um, style transfer still to me like like you can see the deep dream follows straight from the research of the of like the visual class visualizations and so on. So it's kind of straightforward. Style transfer is a little trickier, uh, and I'll kind of do my best to explain it to the extent that I understand it myself. Um, and it came from this paper right here. You can read the paper if you want to give it a stab. Um, it's, and it describes the technique used for it. Since then, there's been innovations to it that we're not going to talk about very much, but there are there is like a lot of work in style transfer uh, style transfer with images. Uh, and more generally, style transfer in other domains too. It would be interesting to do a style transfer in the audio domain, for example. Um, and people are working on that. Um, that one, that's way harder. Um, so there hasn't been, as far as I've seen, there hasn't been like any really effective uh, works to do it yet, but but that's certainly like something that people want to want to do, and I'm sure we'll see it in due time. So, so uh, keep looking out for it. It could be like within months uh, of this class, um, you'll see like something successfully done, uh, and in other domains too. Like, what if you could rewrite like novels in other styles? So it's kind of sort of an interesting technique, uh, and it's been applied successfully in the in the image domain so far. Uh, and to me, it's still pretty magical. Like I, you know, made so many of these, and every time, like I just can't believe. Like I'm blown away, like by how much fidelity to the original style it demonstrates. So, um, so I'll do my best to kind of explain what's going on. So this is the actual math, and I'm gonna, and, and it's I'm gonna kind of describe it at a high level. Um, basically, I think these are like the five equations that define style transfer. So, um, this is the the top equation here is um, the function is the equation that the style transfer technique is attempting to uh, to maximize or so rather to minimize. So there's like a loss term, and the loss is uh, like the dissimilarity in the uh, uh, the synthesized image's content and the content image. So just to get keep our cons uh, terminology consistent, there's a content image. And there's a style image, and let's let's call it an output image, right? So that's what's created from the content and the style. And the output image, uh, you can measure the so, sort of uh, the similarity or the dissimilarity in the content, and we'll define content in a second, uh, of the, the content image and the output image. And you can also derive a uh, corresponding uh, similarity or dissimilarity metric of the style between the style image and the output image. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to, there's a, there's a content loss and a style loss, and they're kind of like, they're separate, basically. They're two separate loss terms, and 
we are trying to minimize their sum. And of course, this, the alpha and the beta here are just like which one we weight more. So like if beta is very high, then the output image is trying to is more inclined to show high core degree of similarity with the style and a low degree of similarity with the content. And if the alpha is high, then it, it'll, it'll prioritize content over style. So this is in, in all the style transfer implementations, this is a parameter that you just have to decide. Uh, because to some degree, style and content reconstruction are in mutual conflict, right? So, um, so we're trying to kind of minimize, or we're trying to do our best with both. Um, now, the content loss is actually really straightforward. It, this this look this may look um, imposing, but all it is is it's the activations. So we'll take the the content image, we'll run it through a covnet, and then we once we when we have an output image we can also run that through the network and we observe all of its activations and then the content loss is just the distance this is an L2 distance so it's like the squared dis like distance formula between the content images activations and the style uh, and sorry and the output images activations um, so sorry distance distance yeah so it's, it's all of those activations, that big, big vector of activations at every layer. <clears throat> and I think in, in generally it's used all of the layers. You can weight the layers differently. That's another thing. Like maybe you're more concerned with content in one of the lower or higher level layers. Um, but, but basically that's all it is. It's just content is actually, it's just, those, it's just the distance formula between the activations. Style is a little trickier um, and I'm going to do my best to explain it. Uh, and I also don't really understand style, but I'll, I'll kind of I'll do my best. Um, so the style is also using the activations, uh, but there's kind of one additional step. So um, you have uh, all of these activations, and you can compute of them. You, you can compute from them what's called a gram matrix. And actually, there's there's different ways of doing this. This is the way they did it in the original paper, and I think most Im implementations are still using it. I think there's other proposed methods, but we'll, we'll talk about this one. Um, the gram matrix is a matrix which, is, which basically for, for, uh, takes the activations and it computes basically like the, the correlation between every pair of activations. Um, so it's kind of measuring like how much different features in the content tend to co-occur with each other. And it turns out, for magic reasons, that this is actually a really good way for uh, to capture the the style of an image. It's how the features, the high both the low layer features and the high layer features, correlate with each other. So if you have two images whose gram matrices are similar, they probably have a very similar uh, style also, because um, style is sort of like it's spatially I I invariant. It doesn't matter where it is. It's like it's kind of like um, throughout the whole image, there's a particular style, and it doesn't have to do with where things happen to be. It's kind of like how different features, different edges, different objects, how they tend to co-occur. I know that's very very <laughs> abstract, but that's that's sort of that's 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 basically you, you're not we're not going to get any better than that. So <laughs> this is kind of uh, and that that's okay. So that's a gram matrix, and then the 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 style loss is basically um, and then there's there's you can compute again it's an L two distance between the uh, gram matrix for the style image and the gram matrix of the output image, and you just can compute a like a distance at every layer. So this is done at every layer. I don't remember what this is doing, actually. I think maybe it's just some normalization term. And then uh, the style loss is, is the sum for, for the gram matrices of the activations at every layer, and they're weighted also. So there's like, this is another thing. You maybe care more about the high layer uh, style gram matrices more than low, low layers, uh, but um, that's, based, that's just the parameter. Yeah? How do, you, how do you separate style and content from the image? Well, they're not separated. There's just two images, right? There's a content image and a style image. 
and then we're imposing, we're, we're creating a new, so there's three images, there's the content and the style, and then we create the output image. So how, how do we detect it's uh, content and uh, we just We just decide, we say this is the content image and then this is the style image. Uh, so what happens in this, pro and again it's an iterative process, so typically you'll start with an image of white noise and then you will compute the, this loss term, so we'll compute this loss term and it'll be, you know, it'll be really high because it'll be, the output image will be just some random white noise and then we can, we can actually, um, again, in a very similar process to Deep Dream, we can figure out how to change the pixels such as we start to lower both the content loss and the style loss. Uh, and we do that iteratively until we are satisfied and then we stop. And usually it starts with white noise. Some, sometimes you can actually start with the content image. That's another strategy that, like as your starting point, uh, which may or, you know, in some implementations that works well and others doesn't. Um, we can see also that content loss, you know, these are both, these are computed separately. And so they might be in mutual conflict. Like you might want to change the pixels differently for, for style resemblance and for content resemblance. So we have to kind of, there's a trade-off um, between them. So this is like some examples. So this is just the Mona Lisa, because everyone's super familiar with it, imposing different style of different paintings. Uh, we can see that like what the process, what the result of this is, those five equations computed with like really huge GPU farm can create these really incredible images. And what's really like the most impressive thing to me is that it seems like style exists over on so many like on so many scales, you know, and like this formula is able to capture it regardless of the image that you use. It works on anything, which is which is really still very impressive. And you can see the results of that. Um, this impl what you're looking at, this implementation was made by, uh, by Justin Johnson, who's a, a graduate student at Stanford in the computer vision lab. And there are also a number, th that's the one that I used for the most part. There's also a couple of other implementations. That one's in Lua, uh, in Torch, which is like a weird, um, I'm not a big Lua user, so I was actually really happy to see uh, an implementation done in Python. So there's also, there's now a number of other implementations, and some of them have different trade-offs with each other. Um, you can also do these at a higher resolution now. Um, so things have sort of gotten better. And you can kind of see. Um. <laughs> Sorry? So uh, when we talk about deep, when we start to look at the deep learning libraries, I'll, I'll point you to the implementations. Uh, in the notes, you can see that the, there is, a, there, on GitHub, like you can just use this. The installation can be a little tricky. Um, next week I'll show you how to use, um, like I, we, I have a few like basically virtual machines that we can use that will, that will be able to make them. Um, and I'll show you guys, I think probably next week, I don't think we'll have time this week. Um, just again, check the time, 527, oh man, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, you can do this on video and I showed you guys this last week and, and this is really, there's no trick to this, it's just, it's just frame by frame. That's why a lot of uh, the, fra the, like the features can jump around a little bit. Um, the only trick I use to make this is basically like blending the output frame with the next input frame. So that helped to kind of create some consistency between the features. Uh, otherwise, it's basically, um, it's basically doing the same thing. And then this is yeah, the same thing, just some more eye candy for you guys and, uh, and uh, different, different uh, just examples. Another cool thing is like uh, one thing you might want to ask is uh, what if what if you make the content loss term what if you don't care about the content loss right so like you um, you just want to synthesize an image from scratch which has a very low style uh, loss but the content the content loss just isn't part of it so that that would just be that would be this right so now there's no correspondence with it there's no content image it's just like pure machine hallucination of a particular style. Uh, I don't know if you can see, like this is an actual image of Arabic uh, calligraphy. And then this is the machine just producing fake Arabic calligraphy. Um, this is Basquiat. And it works pretty well with abstract images, this is Google. So I'm making like fake Google Maps. <laughs> 
Sorry? I feel like I can go somewhere. Using this oh, man, I would, I would <laughs> love to find those places. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's like, it's like, um, yeah, I don't know what a good analogy to use here is. Crab nebula. <laughs> and so on. So that's, those are all different things you can, you can kind of toy with. There's a, a, um, a library called Deep Texture, which kind of does this. This one's my favorite, I think. Just the heads getting mangled. Um, okay, so we'll skip DC again. That's, that's, this is also, um, uh, using covenants, uh, but I kind of want to ask, we, we get an idea of, of image synthesis and I'll, I'll maybe leave this later. This is a little more involved, so we're not going to um, talk about it too much. Uh, okay, so let, let me just quickly think out loud here about what we have time to do here in our last 20 minutes. Uh, I definitely want to do this, transfer learning, so I think we'll do that next, and then TSNI I'll kind of introduce us to it real quick. Uh, and then we'll maybe cover it in more detail next week. Uh, I think that will make sense. So one of the other cool things that we can do now is something called transfer learning. Uh, transfer learning, more in the most general sense, just means that we can apply knowledge learned from one machine learning process to another completely different one. So for so one thing that we one constant problem that we have to deal with sometimes with uh, like let's say image classification, is that we might be interested in training an image classifier in some particular domain, but we don't have very much data. Um, so uh, it turns out that we can do a pretty good job sort of piggybacking on it in the earlier data set that we have a good model for and building a model on top of that uh, and kind of leveraging what we, because you know when, when you train a, any covnet for image classification, it learns a lot about sort of images in general, and that knowledge can be leveraged. Uh, and so in practice, what this looks like is, um, it is actually, um, it, it's it kind of like, well, I'll give you an example, like we can apply it to Wekinator, so we can see this very, um, very generally, uh, but like in a, or sorry, very specifically in the Wekinator sense, but like another, a very, a more classical example would be like, um, suppose you have a data set of, of um, TVs and dogs or something, I don't know. <laughs> and you want to make an image classifier that, that discriminates TVs from dogs. Um, you, and that, that's, those are the only two classes you care about. But let's say you only have like 100 images. If you train a covenant on 100 images, it's just not enough data to tune the weights properly. So it's, it's just for the size of the network and the amount of data you have, it's not enough. But what you could do instead is take a pre-existing cov covenet, like the one, like these huge ones that were trained on ImageNet that we were looking at just now in the implementation, and take the features from here. It's a lot of slide. I really should probably divide these up at some point. Uh, <laughs> And yeah, here we are. Um, so recall th these, right? What did I say about these before? They're magic, right? <laughs> They're magic because they tell us uh, a lot of information about any image, really. You can feed any image into it, and this vector of responses in what's called, sometimes you'll hear like n minus one layer, where n is the number of layers. So this is the second to last layer. The last layer is the classification layer that's happening here. And then you have this layer just before it. And this information, these, these activations are very valuable because they're built on a lot of like prior knowledge. So instead of building an image classifier which takes in the raw pixels of those hundred images that we want to, that we want to discriminate among, we can instead uh, feed, feed those 100 images through this convolutional neural network, which we already have, extract these, these features, and then use these as our inputs to that smaller network. So basically using the outputs, the, these high-level high features, as the inputs um, to a smaller network. So this is the idea of transfer learning. Um, there was actually like a, a while back, 
someone did a, or just a few weeks back, someone did a project called like, is it huggable? Or I think that was what it was. And it was just like, um, uh, it was an example of transfer learning where, where I don't, I don't know who did it, but it was a person who made like a, a data set of, of like images that contained soft, you know, like things like teddy bears and things that you can hug <laughs> and then things that you can't hug like armadillos and spiky objects and so on. And with only a small amount of data, um, they were able to create this like neat classifier by leveraging uh, a pre-trained network before that has these high layer, uh, this high level information. If you have high level information, it kind of should make sense why you need less data. Because once we, when we have more valuable data, it's not as, you don't need as much sort of fine tuning. Um, and that's kind of the essence of, of, of um, transfer learning. I'm going to show you an example of transfer learning with Weckinator, uh, which, which I made the other day. And I'm going to, I haven't, I don't think I've put this online just yet. Uh, but let's see if we can kind of, let's, let's try to run this. I'll kind of do it quickly. Um, so this program right now that I'm launching is, has that the same convolutional neural network that we just saw is implemented. So if I, if I press uh, this spacebar, this is now doing, is analyzing the image of the webcam. Uh, and you see 4096, it's extracting those, those final layer features. Uh, those 4,096 numbers at the end in the n minus one layer. So because that data is much more uh, information rich than the individual pixels, I want to use those and send them to Weckinator. And then basically see if we can uh, do a pretty good job classifying some something uh, with Weckinator. So let's try that. Okay, I'm going to just quickly turn that off. Oh, or I can't. Okay. <laughs> I'll just stop it. Let me launch work. I'll run this and I'll launch Wackinator. Okay, so Wackinator is start listening and we're going to send it 4096. This is way more than we've tried so far with Wackinator. So, so we'll see how well we can do. Um, and we can try to, let's just do a classification. A quick, um, classification, yeah. All classifiers with two classes and we'll just do one of them and let's go okay and now what I'm going to do is so we have two classes that we need to train and I'm going to start recording and then when I press the spacebar this is going to start sending data samples to be the features associated with class one so let's like can I is this yours can I borrow the thermos okay um, so let's like I'll put this in the image and I'll press the spacebar. Okay, and it's recording, and you see it's recording kind of slowly because it's a lot of data. Obviously, we can only encode the image, you know, here or there. Um, I'll kind of zoom in, maybe get a few more samples. I'll stop, and um, now let's do it. Oh, I hope this doesn't take a really long time <laughs> to train. Uh, let's do a remote control now. Okay, and, now, and I'll associate this with class two. Um, okay, so now I'll start recording. Okay, now I've stopped. And actually what I want to do, maybe I'm going to remove some of the samples. I'm going to make it smaller because um, or, oops, because I want, to, I want this to not take as long as possible. So I'm just going to get rid of some of the... some of the last ones for output one, class one. Yeah, I think we can, we can discard a few of these. So let's see if we can piggyback on, on a really small amount of data. I'm curious to see how it will do. Uh, okay, so there's just, there's 44, there's only 44 samples. 44 samples of 4,096 numbers. That's way more like, way more columns than rows. That's usually bad news in, in any sort of data science because it's like we don't have enough samples, but you'll see that it should actually do a reasonably bang up job. Um, oh, that was quick, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, hope, I hope that actually worked. Okay, well, let's see. Um, 
I thought it would take a while. So let's try to run this. And now I will send this. Okay. Class one, right? You see you see it's highlighting over here? Class one. Class two. One. If we tried to do the same thing, just sending the raw pixels, it would just not work because there's just not a, the pixels do not have enough information in them for the network to make a reasonable approximation of what's really going on. But because we expect the activations of these two things to be very different, or maybe not very different, but, but reasonably different, there's enough information in there to do a pretty good job. Um, do a pretty good job, yeah. And so this is, this is really um, neat because now you can think of like, remember this is Wekinator, right? So all we're, I'm just doing a classification, but this can be now hooked up to whatever sort of uh, applications you're using to trigger things, or you can do this with a regression too. I just showed a classification example, but this works in principle with regression as well. Um, so there's lots of ways of now taking this information-rich covenant data and using it to drive applications downstream. Um, so that's transfer learning in a nutshell. I, th I believe, I, I have to double check, uh, uh, I'm not sure, I may or may not have released this yet. I'll put this online though, so for anyone who wants to use it. If anyone wants to use it and doesn't find it online, um, let me know and we can work together. Uh, but basically I have this running, so um, if you want to use it in a project, it would definitely be a really good um, input to use. Okay, so that's transfer learning. Let's get out of here. And let's look at the schedule. So we have 10 minutes left, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to really quickly talk about TSNI, and then I think we'll have to save this stuff for next week. Um, and, because I, and, and probably I'll just do a sort of summarial view of TSNI, and we're not really gonna have time to look at the implementations. But, um, but actually, we'll, we should understand pretty well what this does. So TSNI is a technique for dimensionality reduction in data. So I'm just going to go to my TSNI slides. OK, again, through lots and lots of eye candy. I have too many slides at this point, I think. I have to start splitting these, deep texture. <coughs> Some other stuff. Okay, so TSNI is, uh, is a technique for dimensionality reduction. TSNI has only been around for a couple of years. It was made by um, this researcher named Lawrence van der Matten and Jeff Hinton. Jeff Hinton is actually one of the big names you'll see in deep learning. Uh, and TSNI is not the first attempt for dimensionality reduction. So like some of you guys, if you've done, you've probably, you might be familiar with like principal component analysis, which is a technique for... Um, it's not exactly for dimensionality reduction, but it has that uh, effect. Uh, PCA is used for sort of locating the um, the uh, transforming data in such a way that you f that you find the sort of axes within it which have maximal variance. This is the best way I can describe uh, PCA in one sentence. Uh, uh, but they but for visualization, they're not necessarily super good. TSNI is made with visualization in mind. And what TSNI does is it takes a data set, which may look like this, let's say, there's just some random data set I found in Google Images, and it has many, many columns, right? So here's a data set with a bunch of columns. And let's uh, suppose we wanted to visualize the points in this data set, like we wanted to plot each of these rows. And we wanted to plot it in such a way that like similar rows of data clustered near, near each other, right? And that's a reasonable thing to do. Sometimes we want to like, Imagine you have a desktop and you have all of the, your post-it notes or something and you want to put ones that um, are about the same things near each other. So you want to find some sort of a 2D layout in which points are, uh, that are, have some correspondence or are similar to each other are, are next to each other. There's no obvious way to do that if you have, you know, thousands of columns in your data or even just th five columns. If you have five columns of data, then how do, you, how do you visualize that? And we expect that if it has a, if the points, if the actual, like between two rows, like let's say the first row and the second row, like let's suppose they have very similar numbers, 
then the distance between them is very low, right? Like we can compute the distance if we wanted to, and it would be very low if the two points are similar. The, the goal of TSNI is to find a 2 or 3D uh, transformation, like if we take all this data, and instead of having this many columns, we'll have two columns or three columns of new points such that the points in 2 or 3D uh, are close to each other if they're also close to each other in the original data set. That's basically what TSNI is doing. Uh, actually, TSNI doesn't have to be 2 or 3D. In theory, you, that's just a parameter. But um, typically, it's like that's the biggest use case of TSNI is for visualization. So typically, you'll see 2D or 3D. Uh, and yeah, it's trying to find the optimal 2D representation. Uh, usually, I've been using 2D for the most part. So the t optimal 2D representation such that points are optimally clustered next to each other. Does that make sense? Um, and um, TSNI, so like this is actually just an animation I made. It's not, not necessarily super insightful, but this is like TC, TSNI converging. TSNI actually like, it's not a neural network, um, but it, uh, uh, it's solved in a similar way. It's like this iterative process, which slowly adjusts the 2D representation to maximize some optimization function or to minimize rather uh, uh, an optimization. And the, uh, the, what that function looks like is, um, is also just like a bit beyond the scope of the class. So I'm not gonna really talk about it. There, you, can read, you can read it in the paper. Um, it's pretty mathy, like pretty intensive. So, um, so you may or may not wanna do that. But, um, but what's nice about TSNI is that uh, compared to other dimensionality reduction techniques, it does a pretty good job of like sort of laying them out in a more distributed, sort of less clustered way. Um, and so it ends up being very good for, for, represent, uh, for the purposes of, um, of visualization. Um, I, um, so th this was just, yeah, this is just like random colored bits. So this is 3D data. The points are 3D. Or, or, I'm sorry, the, the data points are three dim, or have three numbers, and I'm coloring them according to that value. So it's just, it's just a color. So like this yellow would be, you know, 255, 255, 0, for example. So these are all just a bunch of random colored points. And then I take that three, 3D representation, and I squash it to 2D using 2 t uh, And so similar co colors tend to cluster together, uh, but not perfectly. Right, you can see that like some of the yellow is sort of like in one region of the screen, and 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 is and some of it is in a different region, and and that's kind of unavoidable because there's really there's never an optimal two D representation that actually preserves the the geometry perfectly. Um, that's just impossible. So there's kind of you'll see this kind of these kind of gaps. So TSNI pr produces something like this. Uh, one thing we can combine TSNI with is with a gridding algorithm. So like if you look at if you look at the one on the left, there's a raster ferry made by, uh, made by an artist named Mario Klingemann. And what it does is it uh, takes like an unsorted 2D uh, collect assortment of points, like what we just saw there, and it finds an optimal grid assignment for it. Um, and, uh, and it just does, you know, basically tries to preserve the geometry. So there's kind of two steps if you want to make a grid. Um, and, and raster fairies in Python. There's also uh, an add-on for open frameworks called OFX Assignment, which is made by Kyle, and that's that, and, and is doing the same thing. Um, and uh, so, what can we do with um, TSNI? That's and why is it? Why are we talking about it if we've been talking about CubeNets this whole time? Um, so, CubeNets and TSNI can be used together to make things like this. So, what is this we're looking at? We're looking at a whole bunch of images. And if you look carefully at them, you'll see that similar images, like for example, these elephants, are clustered together. So here's a bunch of elephants, here's a bunch of gorillas, um, raccoons, and so on. How are we doing on time? 48, okay. So um, everything in, can you guys give me five minutes? Yeah, yeah? all right, good, all right, okay. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's, let's uh, a little bit of an extension. Um, so you'll see that similar images are clustered together 
And the way that we do this is using, every, using the things that we've seen so far today in class. You take the n minus 1, those 4096 digits that represent the second to last layer activations, and you use that as your feature vector to describe every image in the data set. This data set is called Caltech 256. You can find it online. And actually, this is just a subset of that data set, uh, which is just animals that I, that I compiled. And then you take those activations and you run TSNI on them to reduce them to two dimensions. So what happens is every image gets associated with a two-dimensional point where similar images are next to each other. So if you just ran raw TSNI and look at this, they'd be sort of distributed in 2D, like kind of disorganized. And then I also gridded it like this, right? One of these, and that's why it's in a grid configuration. Uh, and and you see that like it's doing a really good job putting similar images next to each other, right? So here's all the, I don't know, the bugs. There's like a scorpion section and so on. Because the activations of images that have similar things in them should be similar to each other. And so if you run TSNI, you should get a pretty, uh, you should get, you know, two pictures of gorillas will have similar activations. So in TSNI, they'll have similar 2D points. Does that make sense? So each yeah. data had uh, 4096 features. Yes. And then you stored it into 2D. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, this is just a few more examples. So this is like a data set of flowers. Um, and other people, so I made this, I released this on Open Frameworks. Uh, there's an add-on called OFX TSNI, which, which does uh, TSNI. This is, the link is in the notes. And other people have used it. So this is made by, by Golan Levin and a student of his at, in, at Carnegie Mellon. So they, they took the whole IKEA catalog. I really love this. This is like, <laughs> you can see, this is all of IKEA. I think the only question to ask is why isn't IKEA's home web home page like this, basically, right? Um, and uh, this was made by an artist named Olivia Jack, who uh, these are like street view photos from I think Bogota, Colombia. Um, this is impressionist paintings by Moritz Moritz Steffener. Uh, There's a collection of yes, yeah, so this one's pretty cool. Um, satellite imagery by Zach Lieberman. So this is all. This is just made using this tool in Open Framework. So it's really actually plug and play. Like if you can if you can create an image data set uh, and put it in a folder, I have a tutorial on how to how to make these. It's actually pretty straightforward. Like you could do this in a couple hours, basically, um, if you can get an image data set. That's the harder thing. This is a, gr a grocery store item data set by Blair Neal, and then I actually just did this um, last week. This is the biggest one I've made so far. This is all of Caltech 256, not just the animals. This is 30,000, so this one's huge. And I can't, uh, I've been trying to, I found this the other day and I can't remember where, but there's this amazing cluster of basically Jesus, Buddha, and unicorns. <laughs> I'm serious, this is, this is all. <laughs> here's the unicorns, here's some Buddhas and Jesus. And there's this part, this tiny sample of this gigantic data set that put all of the Jesus, Buddhas, and unicorns together. So I, I really love that. And you know, you, you know, who could have ever imagined all the unicorns in one place? You know, then this is this is going to help you do that. <laughs> is this an example is based on the classification map. Well, the the, the the original CovNet was trained in order to maximize classification accuracy. But then after that, we don't care anymore. Um, so that's what, how the activations are calculated. It was optimized for classification before, but, but now we have all these examples of things that have nothing to do with classification, which is kind of neat. Um, I also want to show this really quickly. So TSNI is not just for, you know, it's, it's for any kind of data, right? So like it works in the context of this class today because we've been doing CubNets. I showed the, the, um, the applications of images first, but really like you can apply it to anything that can be represented as a feature vector. So this thing right here, and I'll, I'll actually show you the link. Um, this is here. Is, this is basically and this is online, uh, and there's a. I have a IPython notebook on how this is generated, and then if you go here, you'll see the thing that we were just looking at. It's a bunch of Wikipedia articles, a list of political ideologies which have been clustered together using TSNI. You can see there's like a cluster of feminist articles and a cluster of Marxist articles somewhere. There's like a monarchies and absolute monarchy despotism there's like um, 
yeah, I mean, you, you, get, you get the idea. And the way this is generated, the feature vectors associated with each article is basically a vector, um, it, it's, a, it's a, what's called a TF-IDF matrix. So if anyone's been interested in natural language processing, TF-IDF is a measurement of the, um, the importance of every term in this big corpus of words to each article. And it's, calc it's a really, really simple calculation. It just, it just counts the number of times every word appears in an article. And then that's the, that's the numerator. And then the denominator is the, uh, the, uh, how many times it appears in other articles. So like it'll have a, very, a word, a, an element, um, uh, like a word will have a high TF-IDF score for an article if it appears very frequently in the article and does not appear frequently in other articles. So it kind of means that that word is important to that article. And then you can T-SNE the, the TF-IDF matrix into 2D, and then it looks like this, basically. And this is a particular one. So if you have some uh, big data set of, of like, um, things that are just, you know, articles. So these are just Wikipedia articles. If you have a data set of something else, you know, newspaper articles or um, anything that can be represented as text, um, and it not, doesn't necessarily have to be readable text. I was, I've been, I've been hearing like some ideas I've heard about are like um, using uh, DNA, which is text, right? So that's just, and that's just four, four characters of text too. So I don't know exactly. That might need a little bit of preprocessing, but in theory, like any text can be, you know, TFIDF. Um, and you know, besides for the text domain and the image domain. You, any, you know, you guys have all seen lots of data sets. You can cluster them in various ways and visualize them. So that's TSNI. Um, and I'll describe also just like really quickly because we're out of time. Uh, OFX TSNI uh, is an, an add-on for open frameworks that I made that, that has examples for doing all of this. So like the images grid example will <clears throat> made all of the grid images that we saw. And it's pretty easy to use. You just you just compile a folder of images and then specify it and a bunch of parameters and, and it works. Um, so that's something that you may think about using. If you're more interested in, in um, doing this in Python, there's a good implementation uh, in Python using uh, sklearn, the scikit, um, which I don't have an exact I don't have a specific example. But if you're interested in, it, let me know because I think there's a few floating around online that I can dig up. Um, and you can you can certainly use that. Um, so yeah, that's TSNI transfer learning. Are there any questions on all this stuff? So everyone's everyone's probably pretty tired. That was a barrage of uh, that was a barrage of stuff. So um, we'll kind of save the rest. So next week we'll we'll get more into implementation details and like how to actually start. Um, hopefully doing a little bit more application, like actually coding uh, and talking about the different, the landscape of deep learning tools. Again, we didn't get to this, so um, so we'll kind of save it for, for then. Uh, we'll also have Kyle McDonald here next week, so that so he'll show us a bunch of what he's up to. Um, so feel free to like, if people want to come in and, and watch that, that should be that should be pretty fun. And he'll be in for part of the class, and yeah. So basically next week, more application stuff. Week six, more applications, and then week seven, it's all you guys. I can take a break. Um, okay, so that's all for today. So thanks, everybody. See you next week.